and but so speaking of this this uh, of Justice Barrett and the uh, perhaps the idea of them clearing some of this up, maybe setting a new standard uh, to to judge who can and can't be disarmed. Uh, she did explicitly bring up uh, uh, one of the cases in the lower courts range, uh, which is another uh, that is actually a Third Circuit case out of Pennsylvania yes. that dealt with um, somebody who's a felon because they essentially they committed f- food stamp fraud. They lied about a couple thousand dollars there they had a couple thousand yeah. dollar fine and but it made them a, a felon so they're prohibited from owning guns for the rest of their lives and the third circuit uh not the fifth circuit which is you know the one you hear a lot about because they're they tend to be on the cutting edge of uh, these these gun rights cases at this point but the third circuit which is a little more uh moderate in some senses uh they, they did the same thing as in the marijuana case you mentioned they they said as applied to mr range the, this prohibition is unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. And uh, this came up explicitly at oral arguments. Uh, what did you make of that exchange? The uh, the range case was a guy who committed food stamp fraud of, of over $2,000 in the early 1990s in, in Pennsylvania. And the crime for which he was convicted is actually a, a misdemeanor in Pennsylvania. But it's a misdemeanor for which he could have been sentenced to up to five years in prison, um, even though it's a misdemeanor. And that's included within the scope of 922 G1, which is commonly called the felony prohibitor. But it really it also applies to a lot of misdemeanors as well. Right. Um, and, to, and to be clear with these cases and a lot of them, like Range never actually served any time in jail. Um so you no, know, uh, it's just he, something. I, it, I, the, the way the law works is kind of funny, and to, I think to the average yeah. person, some of these things, like he could have served. It was a misdemeanor, but he could have served five years in jail, so it qualifies as a felony under this, or the same thing as a felony, uh, equivalent to a felony. Law, yeah, even if he never served any jail time at all, which he didn't. Right. Uh, so you know, you get these kind of wacky circumstances, and, and I think range fits in there. It does, and so the the Third Circuit in on bond meaning not just a three judge panel, but the all the active judges of, of the, the circuit uh, sometimes get together on bonk to hear very important cases. And they ruled that the G1 can't constitutionally be applied to range to Mr. Range because he's he he did this food stamp fraud. You know, he was he and his wife were pretty poor, but they uh, in the application, they misstated, understated their income to make them food stamp eligible, which was fraud. And so then they ended up paying a fine of over $2,000 for, for the fraud. And now we're a quarter of a century later, and he's lived a honorable life ever since. No, no problems at all. And sues and says, well, I, you know, I'd like to have a, a gun but I can't because I'm on the prohibited persons list. And the Third Circuit majority agreed and said, as applied to range, you can, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll grant an as applied exception uh, to Mr. Range so that, that he can have a gun, even though we're not finding G1, the, the felony and misdemeanor prohibitor uh, in itself to be unconstitutional. Mm-hmm. And then, and this did come up, as you said, at the oral argument, and the uh, Solicitor General Preloger took the view of, no, there should never be as applied exception, um, like as in range uh, on the food stamps, or like as in Daniels on the, the marijuana user uh, in, the, in the Fifth Circuit case, that no, once, once Congress sets the category of supposedly dangerous people, that's it, and courts should never find that anybody within that as an individual is an exception to that category of supposedly dangerous in general. Hmm. Yeah. And she, um, uh, she also kind of punted on the question a little bit too, right? So she said, you know, we'd like to have the opportunity to talk about you know, people like Mr. Range. Uh, she didn't, she didn't say Mr. Range, but people yeah. in those circumstances yeah. in a future case, right. That was sort of, she didn't right. get into why the why, uh, you know, somebody who who cheats on 
food stamps should be disarmed for why they're dangerous, right? She didn't get into all. Of that. Yeah. No, and that that and they've uh, they filed a petition for certiorari, but also in in the range case, as in the, the Daniels marijuana case, and on both of them said, even though we filed a petition, don't act on it yet. Wait till you've decided Rahimi, and then then grant us a cert petition. Then grant the cert petition, and we can do those cases under whatever the Rahimi standard is. Right. But they don't, right. they don't have to so do that, it that way. Then another approach would be to grant cert in Range and Daniels, and have briefing on those this term, and then they could issue, you know, uh, collective opinions on Range, Daniels, and and Rahimi, and give the courts, lower courts, lots of guidance uh, yeah. by deciding all three cases. That uh, you know, Justice Gorsuch had, uh, Gorsuch, sorry, yeah. had a, a number of questions that kind of implied that maybe that's what he wants to do, uh, or at least he, he was laying out that this is an option. Yeah. He was saying we don't have to rule on all this stuff in this particular case, right? right? This is a facial challenge. If there's one scenario where this law could be constitutional, then we have to uphold it. It was the yeah, impression that I got from what he was saying. And then we can decide all these other questions in other cases because they're not really at play here. You know, procedural questions came up a number of times that aren't really the core of this case. Uh, and then, yeah, the, these other scenarios like uh, who's who constitutes as dangerous. I mean, it seemed like they all pretty much agreed that Rahimi is dangerous based on his the facts in his case, you know, his threats yeah. and his shooting, shooting at people and yeah. uh, all the all the stuff he's done or accused of doing, at least. And um uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it feels like at least there's some momentum for that on the court. I don't like you said, I don't want to get out way out of, ahead of things, but I, I got the feeling that was uh, something they were at least discussing as an option. I, I, I think there. There's a maybe a collective sense that, OK, we we did Bruin and Bruin sets up a. Correct originalist test for how to apply the Second Amendment. But then we need to give lower courts, and, and now, that, now that we did that, we have these, these cases coming up like Rahimi and Range and Garland, and or, uh, uh, Daniels. And we need to, clearly the, the lower courts need some help from us in how to apply that as a practical matter. And, I think the court is sympathetic to the idea that it it uh, it kind of has a duty to the lower courts to give them some guidance about what to do next. 